Hi everyone, and welcome to this quick tutorial where we're going to talk about God of War's import hints. So, a few weeks ago, I made a tutorial on the basics of importing assets in Godot, and when we talked about 3D meshes and models, I said that there were more advanced options that you could use to boost your import pipeline even more. Today, I want to explore this topic further, and discuss the power of import hints for giving your assets some embedded metadata easily. So by the end of this video, you'll know how naming your 3D meshes with some special suffixes before exporting them can help you streamline your imports in Godot. Also, note that in this tutorial, I'll be using Blender to show how to prepare some 3D meshes, but of course, renaming is a very basic feature, so you'll find it whichever piece of 3D creation software you're using. Alright, and now with all that said, Let's dive in and discover the basics of using import hints in Godot. First things first, let's have a quick go at what we're talking about, and then we'll discuss why it can be really useful in various situations. So if you head over to this page on the Godot official docs, about importing 3D scenes, you'll see that at the very end, you have something called import hints. As explained at the very top of this section, those hints are a way of simplifying three very common tasks in re-importing assets in a game engine, which are adding colliders, generating navigation meshes, or removing unwanted objects from the imported file. Now, if you're familiar with Godot's advanced 3D mesh importer, you might think that, for example, removing unwanted objects is actually easily accessible via the extra advanced importer window, simply by telling the engine to skip a node, right? Well, yeah, that works, but now what if you're importing a lot of 3D scenes, with some objects that you want to exclude, such as a pack of kit bash elements, and you want to apply the skip import option to each one? Then you see it can quickly become quite time consuming. Godot's import hints are a set of suffixes that you can add to your objects before exporting your 3D scene for the game engine, so that they're automatically processed in a clever way upon import. And therefore, it's very helpful when dealing with batch export import situations, like this. So now, with these docs as support, let's talk about these three types of suffixes and why they can be extremely useful in fastening your import pipeline. Okay, let's start with the simplest suffix, dash no imp for no import. As the name implies, it's equivalent to the skip import option, it just tells Godot to ignore this node and its sub-hierarchy in your imported 3D scene. But again, the really cool thing is that now you don't have to manually open, edit, and save the import settings on each of your 3D files and on each of the nodes that you want to skip the import of. Instead, you just need to make sure that your objects have the right suffix in the scene and it will be taken care of directly by Godot upon import. Typically, suppose I have this simple scene in Blender with a little island, some trees, rocks, and a water plane around it. Now, because this scene was created using procedural geometry nodes, I'm actually using some reference meshes for the trees and the rocks, which are currently hidden, but are indeed present on the sideline. Plus, the water plane has a very simple ripple shader that depends on some dynamic painting and a very Blender-specific shader. Which means that if I were to export this scene to GLTF or GLB as is, and then re-import it in Godot, I'd get my island in the middle, but I would also have a weird white plane for the water, and all my reference models on the side, although I absolutely don't need them anymore. A quick fix for this, without having to manually remove and recreate objects in Blender each time I export, or having to apply the skip import option to all my unwanted elements in Godot, is to use the no imp suffix. So basically, simply by giving this suffix to my water plane object, and to the reference meshes in the trees and rocks collections, I can then re-export my scene, and on re-import, all the unwanted objects have been removed. By the way, it can also be a good idea to do this for the lights in the exported 3D scene or the camera, if you're only using them for modeling or shading tests in your 3D software, 
and your 3D creation tool doesn't auto-ignore them during export, like Blender does. Ok, so you know now how to easily ignore objects by editing them directly in your scene, live in your original 3D file, without having to destroy anything, and without having to manually open and close dozens of import windows in Godot. And yet, to me, that's just the first step of using import hints. Alright, so removing objects and cleaning up a 3D scene with just a few suffixes, that's cool. But we can do even more powerful things with this tool, like creating colliders or rigid bodies. This is a very common thing with import pipelines, because, quite often, the meshes that we import in a game engine are meant to, well, actually be used in the final game scenes and probably interact with the rest of the environment and the characters. So you usually need to give them some bounding boxes, collisions or physics bodies, and doing this manually, especially for complex objects, can quickly become quite cumbersome. More importantly, as we mentioned in this previous tutorial of the series, Godot imports 3D meshes in read-only mode, which means that if we edit them, for example to add a collider somewhere, we need to save these new versions as duplicates, and they won't get auto-updated if we ever re-import the base 3D scenes. Typically, let's consider this Blender scene where I put a few shapes. Now, if I were to export it like this, then import it back in Godot and add some rigid body sphere ball, then my scene would actually only contain meshes, so we wouldn't have any physics and collisions when we run the game. And of course, to add colliders, we'd need to manually edit our 3D scene, and so we'd break the link to the initial import. That's why a better solution is, once again, to use Godot's import hints. Here, if you take a look at the docs, you see that there are quite a few options for us to choose from, depending on the type of collider that we want, and whether or not we want the collider to be also visible after import. The most basic option is the dash call suffix. This will create a triangle mesh collision shape, and it will keep this collider visible in the final game scene. Meaning that if we add it to our red cube, then re-export from Blender and re-import in Godot, then you see that our object is still visible in the scene, and it indeed collides with our ball. Now, if you wanted our other blue cube to be a collider but not be shown, then we could instead use the dash call only suffix. And then you see that in Godot, we'd only get the collider itself, but no mesh anymore. Now, triangle mesh colliders are interesting because they are really accurate in terms of collisions, even on more complex meshes. For example, for a complex shape like a whole level layout, it would properly wrap up this entire complex surface. However, this accuracy comes at a price, and those colliders are also the slowest one. Meaning that if you fill a big scene with only this type of colliders, you'll severely hinder your performance and decrease the frame rate. That's why, for simpler objects, and in particular shapes that are not concave, it's better to use a convex collider. These are a bit more efficient, and still pretty accurate as long as you don't have any holes or creases in your geometry. Typically, in our case, cubes are obviously convex shapes, so instead of our previous dash call and dash call only suffixes, it would be better to use the dash conf call and dash conf call only suffixes. Now, at this point, you might be wondering when you'd really want the collider to remove the mesh from the 3D scene, and just create some invisible barrier in your game. But in truth, that's often because of how slow concave triangle-based colliders are. Basically, because creating such a complex wrapper around your big geometry is really inefficient, something that game creators really like to do is to separate the collision in several chunks that each are more efficient and simpler colliders, but altogether approximate this overall shape well enough. For example, suppose that we want to give collisions to our U-shaped mesh at the bottom. If we wanted to do it directly, we'd need to use the dash call option, but again, this can quickly lower our game's performance. Rather, here we could decompose this UI shape as three cubes, and have those be only invisible colliders. 
By the way, note that in Blender you can also show objects as wires instead of the default solid render in your edit scene to better differentiate between real meshes and extra objects like our colliders here. But anyway, if we leave our main U-shape mesh without any suffix and then give our little cube child objects inside the dash conf call only suffix, then you see that after import, We've basically made a reference intangible shape, that will be the visible element, and then three simpler physics colliders. So we get the right behavior, but with a way more efficient method than if we were using a big concave collider. And by the way, you could even add some little details on your shape, on your mesh itself, while keeping the geometry for the physics quite simple, and this way you would have something really efficient and yet quite detailed visually. Parallel to creating colliders, you can also use import ints to make rigid bodies. This time, you just have to use the dash rigid suffix, and then, back in Godot, you see that your object instantly gets a rigid body 3D component. And of course, don't forget that you can combine the different suffixes to create both the rigid body and the collider, for example. By the way, if you have more advanced objects, like a car, you can also create a vehicle body and some vehicle wheels by using the dash vehicle and dash wheel suffixes. Also, as a side note, you'll notice in the docs that Kodo can also auto-generate even more basic collision shapes, like boxes or spheres, if you're using empty objects in Blender and exporting as a collider, a .dae file. So for really simple, static environment objects that don't need any rigging, animation or anything like this, it can be interesting to consider this alternative to lighten your game scenes even more. And then if you scroll at the bottom of the docs page, you see that there are some very similar tricks for turning a mesh into a navigation terrain, though be careful because the initial mesh will be removed so it will be invisible, or even for making animations automatically loop. And on that note, here you go! You now know how to use import ints to boost your import pipeline and automate the processing of your 3D scenes in a customizable and yet powerful way. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of good tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching and take care!